economist. He's been there, we're telling us, three and a half years. So he's working in that larger research effort with our friend Tom Potowski and some of the alumni of this program, both undergraduate and graduate. Jennifer Shawcross works there in the employment department. Ian Green, who is just finishing up his master's, just finished an internship there in the employment department. It's a place to think about for your own employment opportunities. Nick was telling us that they hire both at the bachelor's and the master's level. Um, so you might give that some thought. Um, he has said that he will allow us to post his PowerPoint to our web page. So if you want to look at that for reference later, it will be available. So I think I'll leave it there and turn it over unless any of you have questions. Okay. If you weren't here at the beginning when I passed out the homework, see me at the end and I've got your paper. Okay. It's yours. questions, go ahead and ask them as we go. Um, the tough questions may be saved till the end, so I have more time to, to please a lot of them. <laughs> How much time do we have? We have all together until 4.30. So, and you can feel free to shut anybody down if you feel like it's not following your question guidelines. <laughs> They're not really guidelines, they just... Um, Sometimes I get nervous and it's hard to make up stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, in two weeks, come see Ray Bettina. Um, I had him as a professor. He's an expert in Social Security. That is a long ways off for me, so I know nothing other than I you know, get Social Security and some of my paycheck each month. Uh, he got me interested in game theory. Um, he's my first professor to introduce that, and I sort of got into it in his class. So if you can tie game theory into a Social Security and, uh, I don't know, it might be interesting to see how it does with that. So, uh, thank you for having me here this afternoon. Again, my name is Nick Palachis. Um, I work for the Oregon Employment Department. There's basically two ways that most of the public comes into contact with the Oregon Employment Department. One, as employers. If you're an employer and you pay a portion of your employees' payroll to tax into the unemployment insurance system, that's how... Um, and um, some employers will come to us to help them find job candidates. Um, most people, though, their experience with us is if they become unemployed and file for unemployment insurance, and they don't call us the employment department, they call us the unemployment department, <coughs> for our official name. Um, but that's how most people know us by. And all job seekers can come and use our resources. There's a lot of stuff online, there's a lot of stuff in person. Uh, people can come to us to uh, help help us help them find a job. Um, I don't know anything about that other than what I said. Uh, I work in a different section of it, a smaller section that deals with statistics um, and related to employment. There's about 60 of us all together. About half of those are uh, economists, as Mary was saying. Um, there's a lot of uh, positions that are available for entry-level economists, and it's a I think it's a great place to um, dive into the sort of data and what economists do for a living. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is the data that we work with. Um, a lot of this data is created in my shop or it's created in partnership with uh, federal or other um, agencies. And uh, there's a lot of information out there. I found as a student, I didn't know about most of it. So um, I was going to use this opportunity to introduce a lot of information, show what it is for Oregon, what it looks like it's doing through the recession and coming out of the recession, and tell you a little bit about how it's made. Um, why is it called the seven dimensions of Oregon's employment situation? Well, I wanted a catchy title that would get people in here on a Friday afternoon. And is there school on Monday? Are there classes on Monday? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. um, nice benefit of working for a state agency is I don't have to work on Monday, President's Day. Um, but, uh, to, yeah, 
coming up with a, a catchy title here, um, I thought about three of the data series I was going to talk about that are pretty important. And um, I shared my idea with a co-worker, Brooke Jackson, who's a fellow economist. And she said, well, that sounds sort of interesting, three dimensions. But, you know, if you're going to talk about those three data series, you also got to talk about this one, four, fifth one, fifth dimension is pretty cool. Um, there's six and seven, and I told her to stop. That's plenty enough. Um, we'll just stop at the seven dimensions, and that'll be a good introduction, hopefully, today. Um, anyone have an idea as what the most popular employment-related statistic should be? What I think is the most popular um, employment-related statistic? Unemployment rate. Unemployment rate, exactly. So um, that'll be the first thing that I I talk about. But I'll go through these very categories <coughs> that um, we work with, and um, hopefully tell you something you didn't know about it. Starting with the unemployment rate. Um, yeah, we can. I can experiment. Okay, we'll have a disco show here while I start talking about uh, Oregon's unemployment rate. It is 10.6% right now. It's higher than the nation. The nation is about 9.1%. And um, Oregon's unemployment rate is always higher than the nation's, pretty much. Um, for the last 35 years, where we have comparable statistics, Oregon's unemployment rate has been higher than the nation in 28 of those years. Um, that's not too unusual right? for for us, also for the West Coast in general, California and Washington are in the same situation where our unemployment rates usually higher than the nation. This graph, the, the top line is Oregon's higher than the, the nation's, and the um, U.S. is the red line, and the recessions are the gray bars there. You can see that unemployment rate will sometimes rise after a recession. That's not unusual. That's uh, the way these statistics work. Um, um, even after businesses start producing more, um, it takes there's it takes longer to hire people. And in this last recession, we saw Oregon's unemployment rate jump really high at the beginning, and that a lot of that was layoffs. We lost a lot of jobs. Um, it was also people entering the workforce. So. Uh, I, Easy to describe situation would be a household where one person is the main earner and the other person maybe doesn't have to work, it's doing something else. Well, when the job situation gets risky, looking bad for the, the main earner, then another person in the household might start looking for work to help out. That causes the unemployment rate to increase higher relative than the actual job losses. And we saw that go up quickly. People did something else. They changed their mind. Um, they they decided maybe they didn't have to go to work, or they left the state, or they enrolled in school, university, college, and all that started up. Um, so the unemployment rate fell going into the recession um, right after the end of the recession, I guess June 2009, and that's been pretty flat. So Was that a new thing where you had a lot of new people entering the uh, the workforce? increasing the unemployment of that high, or is that just typical? It, it seemed really fast, just basically looking at that graphs, um, how quickly it went up, and, and, our, and what it did is actually expanded our labor force much faster than we were able to find jobs. It's not a new phenomena. Um, I found a paper from the 84 that called it the added worker effect. unemployment is the seventh highest in the nation among states. At that period, we were the second highest. It shot way up. Then it's kind of mellowed out because one of the reasons because a lot of other states have done worse. Yes? Um, what you hear more often about is the discouraged worker effect that um, people stop looking for jobs because they give up. And that uh, makes the unemployment rate seem lower than it probably represents the ability to get a job. How does that compare with this recession? Um, you know, I don't have what the discouraged worker effect was on uh, or during other recessions, so I'm not sure how different that is now. Um, the statistics we have, especially statewide, are, are more recent. Um, but the, the 
discouraged worker effect would be you are looking for a job, so you're counted as unemployed. Or you don't have a job, you are looking for a job, you're counted as unemployed. Then if you say, well, I'm just not going to find a job, I'm not even going to bother looking and go do something else. Then you tell the folks who collect this data um, your situation, they count you as a discouraged worker, and you end up not being included in the employment <coughs> rate because um, as I go into the next thing, what is an unemployment rate? Well, to be counted as unemployed, um, you can't be working. You have to be available for work. You can't be in services or in the institution. Um, you, and you have to have made specific efforts to find a job in the last month in order to be counted as unemployed. A discouraged worker is someone who's not making an effort to, to find a job. Um, a common misconception is that you have to be receiving unemployment insurance benefits to be counted as unemployed. That's just simply not true for the statistical definition. So um, whether you are receiving benefits, have ever received benefits, or even qualified to receive benefits, have ever had a job before, it doesn't go into this definition. The unemployment rate is uh, just those people who don't have a job but are looking for Um, by the way, going back to the discouraged workers, um, there's last year there were roughly 220,000 employed Oregonians um, as a what, an annual average. Um, 32,000 additional were additional people were considered marginally attached to the workforce, and they could be discouraged or for some other reason they haven't looked for a job in the last year but they would like to be working. And then another 150,000 folks who are working part-time for economic, economic reasons. These are people whose hours have been cut, or they're working at a part-time job that don't think, um, that don't necessarily, maybe they're looking for a full-time job, um, but they're not unemployed because they're working. The more statistics related to that, yes? What's the method used to determine which workers are making specific efforts to find employment? Um, they ask them, essentially. It's a household survey, so they're calling up folks and um, and uh, asking. And that survey is called the Current Population Survey. Um, when we get down to local estimates for unemployed, uh, I heard there's some econometricians in the room, maybe. Mary alluded to the beginnings are true. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to admit to it. But the unemployment rate at the state and local level is model-based. So. Part of the uh, one that puts in the model is um, the survey sample of the households, and then they use other economic factors to try to calculate the um, unemployment rate. Uh, the, the modeling system is called the local area unemployment system. <coughs> Census Bureau to conduct the, the current population survey, and we end up seeing the raw data and doing calculations, or actually seeing sort of a summary level of data. We're not involved in the actual data collection. We get the results and put in other models to calculate. So I don't know a lot about how they're actually trying to reach out to people. Um, and this data is available down to the county level, maybe even uh, for larger cities that are over 25,000 people. But um, it, um, that's a Portland metro area is 10.2% right now. December's our latest data. Multnomah County itself is 9.8%. Um, we don't really know with these numbers much about why those folks are around. So we don't know if they're discouraged workers um, on a monthly basis. We have to use annual data from the current population survey to, to get at that. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm not too familiar with Oregon's history, but do you know why it's historically had a higher unemployment rate than the nation or even the West Coast for that matter? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I get asked that a lot. 
I wish I had a good answer for that. Um, anyone's speculation is welcome, as far as I'm concerned. Um, stuff that we've just John, John has a yeah, it's the uh, importance of the primary sector, agriculture, forestry. Historically, forestry was closely connected to the interest rates, the housing and the interest rates, and that's for many, many years. With the uh, interest rates so low, it, I think it's changed. So I think it's largely a uh, primary production. So one thing might um, be our particular industries have been affected more over the years, or are um, more, is that, is that what you're saying? That and, and, still, we, we and, and, and still are. Still are. Um, uh, other ideas that are pretty good at um, um, seasonal nature of a lot of our work, forestry work, can only be done at certain times of the year for the most part, so a lot of people are out of work part of the year, and when you add it up, maybe tourism, that can happen to you. They start mixing it up, there's just a higher percentage of people unemployed. It could be harder if you live in one area that's hurting because we're a big state to travel to another city. Um, it could be our nice climate. If you're going to be unemployed, it could be, you know, a good place to be. Um, yeah, you had a question? Uh, yeah. Um, as our last speaker discussed, uh, would that also be indicate that we have a lot of low-skilled workers in Oregon because those are the ones who get hit first and hardest in recessions? Um, I'm not really sure if we're, we're more... We have more low skills compared to the nation, but if there's, you know, like we have more retail since we don't have um, a sales tax, we have a little bit higher retail from people coming over from Washington or something to buy, and those jobs could be easier to cut during a recession and come back. But I don't have any evidence for that. Sort of Migration is a big factor. I mean, the West Coast, people move to the West Coast without work. There's very low unemployment in South Dakota. You know, people leave there. Young people leave. And the West Coast young people don't leave. People, young people come here without work. Yeah, this is the place where young people come to retire, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thanks, Mary. Sometimes I mention North Dakota. I'm always hesitant because there's going to be someone in the crowd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but since Mary already you know, put it out of the open, if you are from North Dakota, then you're living proof that you're here in Oregon now. Um, I've never been there, so I should make fun of it. I make fun of South Dakota because my wife was born there. But I think about North Dakota. Um, unemployment rates by area. This is down to the, the county level. I was saying um, the blue colors are the higher unemployment rates. The red colors are the lower unemployment the whites are um, about in the middle. So you can see what well, you guys know what happened here in Central Oregon. Big housing bust. Yeah. Really high unemployment. Crip County has the highest unemployment rate. In the state, it's uh, 16%. Um, wood products. Um, what's going on with this county up in has such a low unemployment rate? <laughs> Well, that's university that uh, uh, keeps things stable. Along the Columbia Gorge, if you've driven down there recently, a lot of wind farm manufacturing. Around uh, Columbia Basin, a lot of food manufacturing, which has held up relatively well during the recession. Yes, is that a question or a No, I'm just, you know, the University of Oregon is overwhelmed by the timber in your southwestern uh, block there. That's Lane County, isn't it? That sticking out to the sea there. Lane County is this one right here. This oh, it's the one Douglas above County. Oak Camp. So I got the map wrong. Roseburg's a big part of that. Oh yeah, that that is timber. CPS is in person. Okay, so that was unemployment. Now we're going to move into employment. This is probably the second most common uh, indicator. Uh, every month. Here around the time they do this sort of press release, unemployment rate went up or down. And then they'll say non farm jobs increased or decreased, or they'll say it didn't increase as much as economists thought it would. So we're switching over um, from unemployment to a series called the current employment statistics, which is a survey of businesses. 
So businesses are asked, how many workers do you have? And uh, they tell us, and we run some models, and um, try to guess from month to month what the employment is in the state or in the county. This is really good at the, as being the sort of most up-to-date economic information that we have, in that, and it's really trying to get that month-to-month -month change, or things going up or going down. Start of the recession, things went down a lot. Um, right now, we're at 136,000 jobs less than we were in early 2008, and so it's about an 8% drop in the number of jobs for Oregon. It probably bottomed out sometime around March of this year, and um, it's been slowly climbing since then. Um, here are the numbers, the United States, 130 million jobs, Oregon, 1.6 million jobs, Portland, MSA, which includes Clark and Skamania County, and um, Washington, 960,000, Multnomah County, 425. So this is great because we're able to look at all these different levels of geography and compare how we're doing on a month-to-month -month basis to the state, to the nation, to a metro area, to a county. Here it is by county. So that last map was the unemployment rating. These are jobs growth or decline. The blue ones are positive over the last year. The white ones are pretty much like zero. And the red ones are areas that have been losing jobs uh, over the year. This is the monthly month to month look um, at the state, statewide. And you can just see a drop going into the recession. Um, so this is a month-to-month -month decline. So each of those red bars that go down is another month that Oregon lost jobs. Uh, starting in January, we saw our first month of job growth. It wasn't much. And then in April, we see a large spike in the job growth. So that wasn't the economy suddenly recovering, though. Does anyone have any ideas of why employment jumped in Oregon? Census. Exactly. Census. <laughs> the shark of um, There was, in that month, there was a little bit of um, private job growth. Um, the census was a big jump, though. Then it petered out. And then the losses are because those jobs were done. So we started losing jobs month to month. Yes? Um, the census thing was kind of a big discussion about a year ago. Do you ever consider in the future, decades down the line, doing adjustments on that, uh, on that census increase? Because it, it causes kind of a little bit of a distortion. Um, if you adjust it for that, things would look a little different, being that small country. Yeah, and so there's a couple ways to look at that. One is just leave all the census workers in there because, well, there are more people with jobs whether the census is not temporary. And um, the other look is to remove the census workers from that. And we've looked at that also to see was there any economic gain at the time. And um, I don't have a graph that shows that, but we, we have done that. It, it was, uh, I think, five to 6,000 jobs at the peak were just census related. And this, this, well, yeah, this growth is 5,000 jobs. Um, over the year, it'll look like an annual gain of about 1,500. So when you see um, how much change there was from 2009 to 2010, how government shot up by 1,500 in 2010, that can be attributed all to the census. So it can be teased out, um, but it's complicated as I'm sitting here and on about it. I guess. One tenth of one percent. The main issue is that it'll mess up your seasonal adjustments for quite some time afterwards. And so you need to pull them out for the seasonal adjustment, not necessarily for these purposes. All right, so all the metricians heard that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said two, two dogs back that 
the local, it's a, a, a survey of business establishments, is that right? Exactly. But you've got the government in there, so that's one of the establishments you're surveying? Yes. Have you got an estimate on the cut that's going to come this year? Oh, for the future? No, for the government employees. They're quite clearly going to be layoffs. It's just a question of how many. I don't know. Um, um, we should ask Tom Witowski. Okay. <laughs> I know him. <laughs> um, so month to month drops as the recession, uh, excuse me, as the census wrapped up. Then we saw a very large job growth um, in this <coughs> October. And so this is starting to look like some recovery with the October job gains. Um, that's the, the largest month to month increase since uh, 2005. This is sort of uh, almost like a normal month after month, the months of weirdness. Um, what does the growth there have to do with seasonal Christmas jobs? These are seasonally adjusted numbers, oh, okay. so it should account for that. Okay. Uh, I know October is when people start hiring. This, this is above what the seasonal adjustment process would it's expect. Seasonal adjustment. Still, it's odd that it's down. Um, but it's seasonal adjustment. Then, I think it's odd. but well, funny it's stuff still shows up. Here's a drop in December. So I was real concerned after two months of growth. Things are looking good. Retail did add more than it had in, um, in, in years. Um, what was that drop? Well, it turns out this drop can almost all be attributed to everything here is anonymous. Who's in there? But. A college or university, a local government education entity that, or a state um, education holiday, one or the other, that because of the way their holiday <coughs> season fell, they had a lot of people that weren't on their payrolls that in December because of just what, like what week they were on vacation, holiday vacation or not. And so there's a lot of other things going on in the economy. Are adding some things are losing, but that drop there, that net drop, was sort of a, 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 a fluke, and all those people will be back to work on that payroll in January. So this was why we were told that we can't attach the furlough days to these other holidays because that would make people eligible for unemployment. In order to do that, they had to claim that they were looking for work. We received deep warnings on this one, yeah. by the way. So um, that could be. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, what I'm trying to say with this is that last drop in the end, I think, will be evened out with January, December, uh, hopefully. Um, year over year gains, that, that was a month to month change. These are the year over year. Again, here and then, we're starting to see higher employment levels than we saw this time last year. So, good sign. You can see how bad it was uh, uh, during the recession. Um, this sort of survey gives us a lot of good information about uh, industries, how the industries are doing. So, an employment situation, we know very little about what people were doing before they got laid off. Um, with this, we, we know because we're asking the business establishments, we know where they're working um, or what industry they're working in. And this is just the private sector in general. Um, it's employing 15,000 more people now than it did um, at the trough of the recession, which I think was March. So we're, we're how things look right now. So we're seeing real growth, slow growth in the private sector. No growth I'd say it's 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, do you ever hear a term like a lost decade? This is what uh, people are assigned sometimes referring to, um, there's, considering how much population of growth we have in the year, um, that's kind of shocking. And I'll go through a few shocking graphs now, they're still shocking to me, every time I prepare them for a presentation, even though I've seen them over and over again. Um, this is construction industry in Oregon, it pretty much speaks for itself. 
Um, I'd say if you saw if you saw a bubble here, then you might say that's not going to last. It's going to drop down to this long-term level. Don't we wish <laughs> it kept going down? There's a little spike here in the summer. Um, we'll see what that is. I have a feeling it might be some stimulus-related construction that was off-season. So maybe construction industry should have got started earlier in the summer. Something finally came through, employed a lot of people um, in a weird month, and caused a little spike there that was just temporary. Um, one thing I need to mention now before I forget, with this series and with the unemployment series, they are benchmarked and reevaluated at the end of the year. So we'll go back with more complete information, look over everything carefully, and um, um, see how close we got these estimates at the time. So that's done every year, and um, sometimes the numbers that we're seeing here in 2010 won't be the same after the benchmark adjustment, which is, comes out March 1st, I just don't have the data yet. Yes? On uh, your 2010 spike, that's just before the end of the federal subsidy for how, uh, down payments for houses. My daughter works in that industry. In the first half of the year, they were just frantically busy. In the second half, they were bad. Good morning. Okay, next depressing graph, manufacturing. Um, as of yet, I haven't needed to change the axis yet. <laughs> it's getting awfully close. Um, we're at about, we have about the same amount of people working in manufacturing in Oregon as we did in 1970. It's tough to get exact comparisons um, because the series only starts in 1990, but I do a, a best check with other data that was available right then, and um, that's where I'm thinking the level we're at. So that's like a lot. If uh, private industry was a lost decade, this is like a lost third of the century or something like that. Financial activities, this includes real estate and banking. So here's a housing bubble. Um, I show a real estate graph, it looks exactly the same now. You can increase, then drop back down. Um, since a lot of these activities uh, you know, are really people related, you know, you still you still need to go to a bank, you still you know need real estate um, and advisors and stuff like that. This will probably stay at like a long-term trend, um, but you can definitely see the bubble there. Government, everybody remembers what the spike was, federal census workers. So those that would include federal as well as state and local? Mm -hmm. This series, we do have more detail. I don't have it in my slides, but this sort of, this sort of uh, information is broken out. State, say, education, um, local, tribal, which is uh, local government, and uh, local education. It's all available on our website. Retail trade. Here's the, um, these are seasonally adjusted numbers again. So here's the, um, Sort of more hiring than in the previous years for the last <coughs> year. Did you get that same last day? Um, now I'm going in, I see a lot of industries going trying to go into the ones that look like um, they're seeing some real recovery. Professional and business services, starting to see an increase there. These are businesses that help other businesses do business, so they could be computer type advisors, um, um, you know, setting up com new computer mainframes, um, they could be temporary health agencies, they could be janitors, gardeners, um, it's kind of the folks who keep our world running, um, they seem to be seeing some recovery. Education and health services, they pretty much avoided the recession, except that there's just dramatic growth was cut short. Um, so we'll see that may continue to grow because of demographics. Okay. Um, so, 
This is the current employment statistics series. Um, I wanted to get like someone else's perspective of use um, of this data series. And so this was given to me by an economist in the Oregon Office of Economic Analysis. I usually stay away from bubble charts. I love them a lot, but I end up you know, trying to explain them uh, more so than to get <coughs> the information out of them. But Mark McMullen, who works with Pompatowski, sent this to me um, two days ago. I'm like, i got to include this because this is using our CES numbers. And um, each of the circles is a metro area. The larger ones are larger metro areas. And it's, it's kind of showing a time series of where Portland was in relation to uh, where it was and where it is in relation to other metro areas now. And here are the times. Each one is labeled to a dot. December 2007. Now we're looking at change over a year ago, a long-term change, and um, change over three months, a short-term change. So if you're up in this quadrant, you're expanding. That's where Portland was in December of seven. If you're in this quadrant, you're slipping slowly. That's where um, Portland was in June 2008. Contracting, 2000 and, well, yeah, December 2008, June 2009, December 2009, I think the thorough means were like off the chart. <laughs> um, June 2010, finally in the improving quadrant, and then right now we're here about where Los Angeles is. Uh, so a, a nifty chart, if you guys see something like this, now you know a little bit more about the background for where the data came um, from to put something like this together. The star here is the U.S., the, the all area average. Okay, on to um, the next dimension, the third dimension. Um, this may be the, the most important uh, data series to maybe even our whole profession when it comes to economics related to employment and wages. This is a quarterly census of em employment and wages. And what this is is another um, form essentially asking businesses how much, how many employees they have and how much they pay them. But this is part of a tax collection process. It's part of um, their payments into the unemployment insurance system. So there's real enforcement behind making sure that all employers report. It's really gone over with a fine tube comb and it's the most accurate of any of these, I think. But it takes longest to produce. It's old data by the time you get it. You don't know what's, you know, you, you can't look at it and see where we are right now. You're looking at it and see where we were uh, half a year ago. Um, but this forms the basis to our benchmarking for the other series that I talked about. And um, this gives us the most industry detail and geographic detail. You can actually use this data to do some really cool GIS stuff um, to get some super detailed information. So these are <coughs> folks that have workers who are covered in the unemployment insurance system. Um, I just put up some interesting data there. I don't have much to say about it, but see the number of businesses that have employees, what the total employment is, how much money all those employees are earning, and an average wage, Oregon is $40,000. Portland City is $47,000, yes. I'm curious about this, this data set. You hook it up with things that you also have, too. Um, something that came up recently about East Portland is they were curious about doing a census on where people live and where they work in order to find out if they should um, look into development which is transit-related or job skill-related or job creation-related. So can you hook this up with not just where they work but where they live? So you, you got this question from them? Well, it was just something that came up, and I said I didn't know, I didn't know this data very well. And, and so you'll be able to, at the end of this presentation, you'll be able to go in there and show them what they're looking for and 
Uh, actually, no, I was going to do it for free. <laughs> okay. Very noble, but um, yeah, I'll point to the, the, the print the best data set for that. Okay. Thank you, sir. This, when it says Portland City Limits, it means that the pay is made in Portland City Limits, not that the recipients live in the limits. Exactly. So this is the, the business location. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yes. So maybe you went over it, but are you just raw nominal dollars with no cost of living investments made or anything? Are they just the raw, just yeah. raw figures? Yeah, like... You know, when the folks pull out their paycheck and look at oh, it, okay. that's what's there. Okay. And are these all jobs, or these are full-time only, or 35 or 38 hours in the body? All jobs. All jobs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this average, um, uh, I, I don't know, I can't really talk about specifics, but, you know, the Portland Trailblazers are included in that average. <laughs> uh, so someone who's just working um, at a special weekend fair for one day, but... Series covered employment wages. Covered means covered by the unemployment insurance program. Um, ES202 is the form that gets filled out. So um, it's kind of a, an older term, but it used to be called ES202. Yeah. So just if you hear those terms, we're talking about the new name, quarterly census of employment wages. Um, oh. This is real simple. It's collected for tax insurance, you know, for unemployment insurance tax reasons. It's really clean as far as what industries and the locations of the businesses. But once they put that data in the ground, as it were, they move on. There's no benchmarking. This is actually the basis for other benchmarking. Um, and that, that can create problems, especially in a small area, like say one county, if employers move or change how they're reporting or um, switch industries because of business practices that change or if we had it wrong in prior years, it gets changed in the new year. So this data doesn't work very well as a time series because if you're looking at one area that may or may not have been actually included other businesses that were in in the previous area. So um, the current employment statistics that I show in other graphs are time series. That's what they're made for. We can't much, much change. These aren't, and they're old. So I didn't have any nifty graphs, but I felt like I should put one up here. Um, anyways, this is looking at that data that's been adjusted for inflation over time. The bars are the consumer price index for the Portland Salem area, and the line is how the wages changed after being adjusted for inflation. So you can see in a year like this, Wages went up way more than inflation. They came down with wages came down with inflation, uh, or with you know sort of no more inflation um, of 2009, and they're increasing at about the rate of inflation right now. Dimension four. Now we're going. We've we've looked at. Unemployed, no matter where they came from. We looked at two measures of industry employment. Now we're going to look at occupational employment. This is done through another survey of businesses. Businesses just must love all our surveys. <laughs> um, asking, like, what, what kind of workers do you have? And um, you know, how many economists do you employ? How many gardeners do you employ? How many stock clerks do you employ? How much do you pay them? And um, after all that's processed, uh, I get a neat graph like this that shows um, the employment by occupation, and I've attached a minimum required degree or training to that occupation and summed it all up here. So the bar will go out, there's over, 
It looks like 650,000 jobs that just require short-term on-the-job training. Most of those pay under $30,000 a year. So there's a lot of information here. Bachelor's degree, not nearly as many jobs. Most jobs don't require a bachelor's degree. However, if you want to get paid at least $30,000 a year or over $50,000 a year, then you need a bachelor's degree. Um, and an advanced degree, you can see how much smaller the number of jobs are, but they're all in general higher paying jobs. So that is the education levels required for that job, not necessarily education levels that people have, because that's one thing you heard a lot about was people taking, looking for jobs lower than their education level out of desperation. Exactly. So um, in, in, in real life, you'll find a lot of people with these working in these, of course. Um, this but this data doesn't get at that. So this, this data has got from employers saying, all right, these are the jobs that we have, and these are the requirements that we're offering, not a, a picture of these are the people in the jobs, and these are what they have. These are the uh, skill set. Thank you. The skill set they have. That it's, it's from top down rather than bottom up. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Thank you. Um, and actually, we're asking employers what kind of occupations you have and how much you're paying them. And then we attach an education requirement to that occupation. And so that gets the, you know, that that separates the what people are actually doing to what they sort of education they actually need for that position. And so we're trying to break out here. And do we know what the proportion of uh, pay by skill set is for Oregon in relation to the rest of the United States? I mean, like, is, is, is the distribution that we're seeing here, uh, is that similar to what we're seeing in other states, or is it different? I got a graph that you're going to love. This is the type of uh, a broad occupation uh, with the employment and um, the wages. So something that's pretty easy to see, like um, health care. There's not a heck of a lot of people in healthcare compared to the overall economy, um, but they have a higher percentage of the red bar, the higher paying jobs. Now, like in a hospital, a hospital will employ the whole gamut of occupations. This is looking at the doctors, the nurses, the nursing aides, etc. Of course, hospitals will have office workers, janitors, etc. And those are like the top larger occupational groups, office, service, professional, and related, real kind of broad occupations that a lot of people are in. Well, before you move on, I have been digging around trying to find farm worker wages. Very challenging since they're not covered. Yeah. But are they then in this data set? Or this is only a part of farm employment? Um, so, Mary made one good point that I for forgot to mention is that um, I said we're surveying businesses here. We get the, the, the businesses, we know about them because of the covered series. Not all workers are covered by unemployment insurance and a large group of that are farm workers. Their employers don't have to pay unemployment insurance coverage into them. So we know less about them um, um, from, from some of our series. Um, in this one, some workers are, some farm workers are going to be in there. Um, probably not the migrant workers that you're that you're looking for. Um, Do you have any sense of what the cutoff is here? I mean, I've been told one of it's very helpful comments Amy Vanderbilt's been telling me about Washington tends to do more modeling of what these wages are, and Oregon does less. But I'm wondering. You don't have to answer this right this second, but if you can, if you have any sense of what proportion of agricultural workers would be included in this case? Um, I, I don't, and we are working on a, a series for that, so um, but, but, but let's keep talking about that later, because we do have a new series, uh, a new survey, another one of our surveys, to try to get that information. 
So in Oregon, some farm workers are covered. Depends on how big your farm operation is. In Washington, all farm workers are covered. So they have a more complete data set than we do. In other states, it might not require any farm workers. So when we talk about covered employment, that varies from state to state also, depending on um, the state laws governing that. <laughs> um, all occupations the for the annual mean. Uh, so here I have the median hourly. Yes, I question. Here, here for all occupations the median hourly hourly wage and a mean hourly wage, which is way higher because of high income people. That's really high. I hope I got that number right. You um, <laughs> probably did. And then um, mean annual, 32000 a year. Um, looking at the occupations, you know, we estimated in 2008 there were 373 people working as economists in Oregon. And those are folks with economics degrees. Those are people who, you know, their job says economists, essentially their employer is saying this is an economist. Mean annual, um, I wish. <laughs> uh, Post-secondary teachers, which will include you know, everything from someone um, just as an instructor at a community college to um, the highest, you know, the highest earning college professor who's not like in a management position. That's the sort of information that's available from the occupational employment statistics. Um, this is a graph that shows how we compare to the nation by, um, by sort of our occupational wages. And you can't read the, the small stuff here. It's not too important. Of course it will be available online to look at it if you want more detail. But here, the, the each column has two bars. The left-hand bar is Oregon. The right-hand bar is the United States. The wage. These are lower-paying type occupations. Food preparation and service. We're a little bit higher than the nation in our hourly wage. That's just because of our minimum wage. Because of our minimum wage, exactly. So we're higher in like all these um, lower-paying occupations. Healthcare. There's a lot that were real close that I skipped over in this graph. And then these are our high wage occupations where we're lower than the national average. So legal, computer, management, engineering, we tend to pay less than what these workers earn nationally. Okay. That's enough with the occupations. On to the fifth dimension. These are the local employment dynamics. Here we have employment by age group. And the blue bar on the left is 1991, what our age distribution was for Oregon. The red bar is 2010. So these blue bars show that a much higher percentage of workers were younger. And then, of course, Two decades happened, and now with the red bars, you can see it's skewed towards uh, older workers. This data series, the local employment dynamics, is pretty cool. It's a partnership between the states and the U.S. Census Bureau. We give them that covered employment that we have that has uh, also all the individuals who are employed. And of course, when you're employed, you have to give your social security number to your employer. We hand this stuff over to the Census Bureau. They match it with IRS records, because of course when you file your taxes, you have to your Social Security number. They do a match, and then they have where you work, how much you pay, from, or how much you're earning through work from us, essentially, from the states. And then they take the IRS information, now they know where you live. This is a matchup, Jamie, between where they work and where they live how old they are, and their gender. That's also the age period. Someone said that somewhere. Um, I like these age 
these are the only way we can get employment age information. Um, I like these a lot, so um, tend to use them. But we could also have g the gender and also um, like turnover, how often people are switching jobs, and that sort of thing. Um, the series I just showed you is from something called Quarterly Workforce Indicators. There's also something really cool called On the Map, which is sort of like forefront level GIS uh, application that um, that is kind of studying what it can do for free and public information. Everything in here is all checked for confidentiality since you know they don't want to they don't want to have anyone be able to identify an individual using this data. So they also have some statistical techniques that like substitute fake data for real data. And it's interesting for the uh, commentators and people are into that. Um, what I end up with is a cool tool that shows a map. It shows where people live. It shows where people work. This little section is from um, Malheur County, Ontario, Eastern Oregon. And it's showing the dynamics of workers and residents on the border there. So um, it's looking at a little, it's taking into account a little bit of Idaho. This is another neat thing about this is um, I get Oregon information. I don't get Washington or Idaho, Nevada, California information. But the Census Bureau will do this so we can match up where our workers actually live. Do they live in Idaho in this, in this map? Um, or yeah, the other way, where our residents do they go to Idaho if they work? Um, I wish I, I wish I would have brought a map like this of Portland, but I do know some of the numbers. Um, anyone have a guess of how many people who work in Multnomah County live in the state of Washington according to this data series? It's a big number. Lower, lower. It's a big number, but it's about 10 or 11 percent. Of the total labor force? Uh, of people who work in Multnomah County who live in Washington. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of people who you know, go through Portland and work in Washington County or something like that. Right. In Hillsboro, but yeah. just in Mul just sorry, just in Portland City limits. Uh, so this is great information um, when you answer these kind of questions. And there's a lot of possibilities for looking at East Portland and seeing how people live in be happy to help you out with this. You uh, can pull up the information. You think, you're saying this is publicly available on the web? Yes. Um, What's it called again? The series is called Local Employment Dynamics. You would go to www.census.gov and you would see a link for it there. Then you're getting into this group of information of data where we're sharing information with the Census Bureau. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this thing is called On the Map. That allows for this, um, this sort of research. And I have um, links at the end of this presentation to everything I've talked about. Okay, dimension six. But that, that last step I feel like I just went over too, too quick, maybe in a lot of stuff. There's really cool data that's available from the local employment um, dynamics. but. We gotta move on. This is help wanted online. Um, this is a, a product of the conference board. And what they're doing is searching the internet for um, help wanted ads. And we use this to help job seekers find jobs. So um, someone can come into one of our offices, scroll listings that are available for um, that employers have told us, and then they can also use this to quickly look online for jobs that are available to them. It's looking at boards like monster.com, those sorts of sites, and, but it's pulling them all together for one uh, in one source. So what I like to do with it is to count the total and see if I can get any idea of where the economy is going based on that. And this is a summary of the number of one, one in online ads for Oregon. You see it dropping during the recession, increasing slowly, this is brand new stuff. There's only like three years of data available for it right now. Three or four years. And um, here's a real life problem for the econometricians. Here's a huge jump in seasonally adjusted 
when it adds, but when I look at the raw unseasonally adjusted, there actually wasn't any jump between December and January. So I think this was a failure of the REMA model because there wasn't enough data in this brand new series. The folks at the Congress Board run it anyways, but when you have like the first two years of huge drops because of the recession and then a flat point, it's expecting a huge, the model's expecting a huge drop. It doesn't see it. That's like a huge increase, but in fact it was the recession, not the seasonality, that caused the model to behave like it did. Um, I wouldn't be saying that publicly to you guys except by contact of the conference board said what's the deal here. They said, yeah, we agree, uh, we're going to try to fix it and stuff like that. But right now, that's what I was saying. Yes? Do you recall the order or, or uh, lag on the uh, REMA? Um, I didn't do it, but I assume it's still one. Okay. So that would be one thing if I had more time is take that raw data and kind of run with it and see what I could do. Or just cram some numbers in there to try to get it to behave. Sort of a, not an answer on your exam, don't say that, but yeah. <laughs> there are tools to, to kind of deal with this, and I think they're going to work on straightening that. Yes? Are there any implications of that widening spread between the total ads and the news ads? Um, I don't know. Oh, sure. Uh, the new ads are ones that just oh, showed up no. within the last 30 days. The totals are ones that they found last month. Um, but you can have an ad out there even after you fill the position. You can put an ad out there and not fill the position. We only have about three years of data here. So um, it's very interesting to me um, and I'm just sort of excited about it. But right now the most useful end result is getting those ads to the job seekers. So really um, has there been any study done on the length of time companies are taking to fill positions? Um, as opposed to before the recession? I mean, because we're looking at, in terms of, you know, the dip in, in the new want help on it ads, it isn't that big, but in terms of job loss, we saw during that period, it was humongous. I mean, so is, is there been any sort of shift in how long companies are waiting for those positions that they're advertising for? Um, I don't have any data for that. Um, but that's sort of the story. You can wait a lot longer now to fill a position. You might be more cautious. <coughs> yes. Also baked into that is I ran a human resource company at one point in time and some ads are just always out there even as you're filling a position because you've got a hundred secretaries in your organization so you're always looking for more secretaries even as you're hiring five or six of them that ad is sitting out there. Yeah. I'm, the other people are stronger at this than I am but I, I think people post ads and then don't unpost them. And I have no idea how the rate of change on that works because I'm not even very sure on the level. Yeah, that's going on also. Um, they they do a lot of work to try to make this into an economic series. There's the initial spidering of the internet where they just grab everything, and that's used by other people. The economists are using a series that has um, the filter, so you're not you're not grabbing the same. Um, ads that may be the same job but are located in, in other areas, uh, that still shows up. Um, the actual number of 55,000 vacancy or um, online ads in Oregon, I don't think there's really 55,000 vacancies right now. I think uh, there's probably at most about 30,000 based on other stuff um, that we do um, because of doubling and um, stuff gets through people just leaving. Out there just because of the, the lag between the ad going out and it being filled, I would think that the distance between those two is correlated with the height of them. So you, if you have more jobs available, it's going to be more being added and more posted, but as the jobs go down, there's going to be less added and less between them. Maybe the directions change. Um. Yeah, this is fun. I, I, I like this data. I haven't seen any published articles using it. It's kind of interesting. Um, and it could be because we just have a lot to figure out about it. Yes. You also pay for an ad by the month, usually for most of the online companies. 
and there's no incentive to take it down because if you get a couple of good resumes that might fit for another position, it doesn't harm you. So there's going to be a built in lag just from now on. Yeah, and Nagi is a real life example of that because um, uh, I can go in there and look at which firms are, if they say who they are um, in their ad. Sometimes they don't, they're really mysterious. Sometimes they say who they are. And I was like, what is this about all these blockbuster ads, like the day they got this delisted? What's up with that? <laughs> and there was one in Salem, you can get the geographical detail for the ad, so I called them up and sheepishly. Are you actually hiring? Said, no, we did have a vacancy, we filled it, but that ad's just always out there. So, let's do. Yes? No, go ahead. Then. Uh, here's a, a comparison of an index starting at the recession. How are you doing compared to the U.S.? So, you can see we kind of lag going in to the recession. We know that from other series that does show up here. Um, how the U.S. index starting in December 07 was flat. And um, Oregon kept increasing for a few months before it dropped down. Just another interesting thing. Here's for the Portland area. This is not seasonally adjusted. It doesn't have any of the problems, but you can just, uh, that I pointed out in the other graph, but you can see it is higher than it was during the recession, of course. Uh, the seventh dimension. This is where I gave up adding dimensions and just started throwing everything else that we did. Um, I don't think we have enough time to go through them all, but um, another another thing is the quarterly <coughs> wage reports, which is really interesting data that's not explored too much. I am going to show that. We do special projects. We did a big PCPI report in the fall um, that took about half a year for you know a few of us all kind of working on it when we could. And it was at the request of the governor. The governor said, essentially it comes down to, I've heard some stuff about PCPI. I want to get your unbiased because we need to be unbiased, they'll have an opinion on it, but we're data experts, so we looked into it and report back to the governor. And so um, this is just one example of the kind of reports that we'll do. What was PCPI? Um, it's for Oregon, it's 30, no, oh, it's a per capita personal income. Let's skip that part, sorry. <laughs> That's a Bureau of Economic Analysis series, so it's not even done in Oregon, it's done in Washington, D.C. And we essentially, our task is to figure it out in more detail than I ever explored before and uh, present the information. Um, and that report's available on our website. We do a vacancy survey, that's so I get to figure out there's probably about 30,000 vacancies right now at any one time in Oregon just because of, of turnover or some employees having kind of trouble finding certain workers. And we also did a future hiring survey because people kept asking us, well, when are businesses going to start hiring? When are businesses going to start hiring? I don't know. Well, why don't you ask them? So we did. And uh, <laughs> we got some results from that. Quickly, because I think I'm running out of time here. Um, these, these are really cool. These are the wage, quarterly wage records. So these are looking at individuals. And we have not only how much they got paid during a quarter, but how many hours they worked. And it sounds kind of ridiculous, but this is really rare data. Only three states in the nation have this information. We're one of them, Washington and, uh, I don't know, maybe two others um, have it. But this isn't something you can look at nationwide. It's just not available. And we, we do quarterly updates as part of the unemployment insurance system, of course. We do quarterly looks into this. And um, I noticed something really interesting with the last quarter of data, which is the second quarter of 2010. It's always old data. The number of workers in Oregon that quarter who had never appeared in our system before was much higher than it had been throughout the whole session. So these are workers who have never paid into the unemployment insurance system since 1990, as far as our data goes back. They either have to be brand new workers, getting their first time normal job. They would, could be um, self-employed workers who don't have to pay into the unemployment system. Or they could be from out of state coming to Oregon and landing a job. 
and I thought that was a sign of something that we're getting new workers, our, our current level of employment is having new workers, um, more so than in the normal or the session here, our quarter. Um, and we also have wages attached. Median wage of new workers is nine fifty compared to median wage by this measure sixteen fifty five. There's a lot of new workers in the lower wage industries like leisure and hospitality because they have a lot of turnover. I mean, this is just counting the number of people. A lot more people go through the leisure and hospitality industry than say um, the information industry at any one time. I thought what you just said was quite interesting because there is some anecdotal evidence right now that employers are discriminating against the unemployed, especially the long-term unemployed, so that as new jobs are being created, it looks like they don't want the people who haven't, you know, who were employed, say, two years ago and have been unemployed since. Are you getting a sense of that, that the, the new jobs are going to completely new people? And um. Well, I don't have any data for that, and I certainly hear it. This sort of supports it, maybe. Um, we don't know anything about these workers other than that they weren't working in Oregon before. Uh, it's interesting, you know, that really high unemployment rate, and where are the new jobs going? They're not going to those people, and really is what you're saying, isn't it? That could be. I'm not saying it, but it's sort of, yeah, it's sort of going an along those lines, isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah. a scary implication, too, you yeah. know. Here's our per capita personal income report. Um, per capita personal income is all earnings from any source within Oregon uh, divided by the population. Um, you guys are all good with algebra, so you can see that population matters when calculating the per capita personal income. Largest component of it is earnings, though. Um, here's, a, here's a graph of it compared to the US. We're the lower line now. Um, 36,000 per year compared to nation's 39,000 per year. Um, that's a question, why are we so low? Um, here's a historical graph. I like this because it shows World War II shipbuilding. <laughs> a lot of money being made per person living in the state. Um, things are kind of normal. Had a good run in the late 70s with um, forestry products that <laughs> in the early 80s, and we've never fully recovered. Did nicely in the 90s. Um, that's where we're at. Some of the reasons are higher our employment rate. We have higher employment rate, which people are working, less money per um, head. Um, we have a lower employment to population ratio, which is tied to the unemployment rate, so less people working again. Um, we have a shorter average <coughs> work week, which I thought was interesting, so people already work less than hours per week. Um, and that, that ties directly into our higher share of part-time workers, which, which um, most of which are part-time workers, are voluntary employers choosing to work part-time. Do you consider workers who work under contract, where there's some one who organizes and contracts out their labor and mass contract labor? Um, I, I deal with it in Germany. It's a growing segment of the population. I'm just curious where we are. For the, for the um, I don't know. I don't know how much, so how much is untracked labor? So um, black contract. market? Yeah. No, yeah. not black market. It's contract just, It's where a, uh, a firm uh, hires their people out and takes a percentage. Oh, um, I don't know. Maybe we'll just talk about that. <coughs> more. Yeah. Yes. Uh, related, when you were talking about this search of the internet help wanted, a, a long known phenomenon in unemployment is whenever unemployment goes up, the foundation of new businesses also goes up because large numbers of people can't stand to be unemployed so they employ themselves. And in my children's generation, they're all opening internet businesses. And I don't know whether Dun & Bradstreet's catching those or not, or are the, these spiders, what is the term you use to search the internet, to find all of these funny little businesses? For that particular thing, um, if they're 
if they're posting a, an ad out there, you know, if they were advertising on on Monster.com, no, I'm not talking about Monster. I'm talking about somebody that my daughter has a friend who is now selling fashion clothes on not, the internet. They're not in that. So that's sort of a, a different thing that I don't have any info for. Did, it, is the data still true that when unemployment goes up, the foundation of <coughs> businesses also goes up? My sense is it is, but I don't have the data. Yeah, I don't have it either. <laughs> uh, generally, every country and state has a shadow economy. Do you know how large our shadow economy? I don't. The per capita personal income should cap capture some of that, actually. Believe it or not, something I learned. Um, uh, our data doesn't. You have to be legal and paying right. your taxes and stuff for me to catch it. Um, <laughs> per capita personal income, though, they tried to account for that. So I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, re other reasons are less are sole proprietors earn less, so self-employed people earn less. Um, that's kind of funky data. I don't give it a whole lot of weight. Uh, a lot of our money, though, leaves the state, so this is clear. Earning in Oregon gets counted in Washington's per capita personal income. I know from the on the map source that 89,000 people in Oregon without a, working in Oregon without a state that lowers our per capita personal income by at least one and a half percentage points. Other factors that economists often talk about, um, I, didn't, I, I can't look at, I don't know enough about other things like quality of life, investment, and education. Tax structure, it's got to be something to it. I don't know enough about tax economics to look into it. The Bureau of Economic Analysis, the BEA of Calculus, did look at uh, cost of living, and um, they found that if you could adjust for cost of living in Oregon, it's like our PCPI goes up $1,100. That's about a third of the gap. So part of it could be explained because <coughs> things are cheaper here than in places like Hawaii and New York. Um, here's a map to kind of show people that yeah, our PCPI is lower than the nation, but look who the nation includes. All these really high earning areas, like Manhattan, um, and oil, Wyoming, low capita, high income. And um, we're kind of normal. We're among the 30 states that have a lower per capita personal income than the nation. So that, that's an example of a special report. Surveys, these are the number of vacancies. This is a survey that we do and um, before the recession, 48,000 employers were looking for workers in the deepest, darkest nights of the recession. It was still 18,000, lower, but um, now we've kind of slowly creeped back up. <coughs> That's the vacancies by um, industry. An interesting thing, thing here is we ask employers if it's a new position or not, kind of get some idea of what's going on, if it's if they're growing or not. 14% um, of the vacancies were for new positions. This is much higher than usual. This is like 2 or 5%. So I think that's some good indication that there's some recovery going on. Educational requirement of um, the vacancies. Most employers, starting here, going all the way to here, saying, you know, a high school degree or no education, I don't care, will be fine for the job. Very small for bachelors and graduates compared to the whole economy or the whole vacancies. But you know, already we saw another data that, that good paying jobs require that. Um, and there it is. <laughs> Again, jobs openings that pay more than $25 an hour are a small piece of the overall pie. Yes? Uh, I can't remember. Did you say at, at some point earlier you, in your presentation um, the percentage of workers looking for these jobs who hold those higher degrees? I mean, like, is it is it more competitive in that upper area than it would be you know, overall? Um, that's a great question, and I haven't done that calculation. Uh, it's hard to know. It's hard to know about who's looking for jobs. I mean, we know how many are employed, but you're still looking for a job manager employed sometimes. So it's hard to get at. And you can, you can use um, surveys of people like the American Community Survey to do their education breakouts, but then you don't know who's looking for a job now. Um, if you 
future hiring survey, that's where we ask. The vast majority of employers say no change, and that makes sense. Employers aren't always growing huge or going out of business. It's only the margins that we see any change. So the vast majority, no change. At this time of year, 15% said decrease, 11% said we don't know, 12% said they're going to increase. They didn't, we don't know how much they're going to increase or not. So um, this is a brand new survey that we just started though. So I don't know much about interpreting these results. We're going to keep doing this every six months. The businesses that did say they were going to hire more than not, we're going to expand more than not with professional technical services, information, education, and uh, it goes down like that. Um, most hiring is for turnover reasons, of course. Uh, not so much for expansion. Uh, this is a, a, a very interesting thing. We asked them why they weren't going to hire if they're not going to hire. And of course, the number one answer was related to the economy. Is the economy stupid, right? Um, but 18%, of course, so, said something related to government, like taxes or regulation. Uh, just cool, <laughs> cool information there, um, but not much to do with. Um, the slideshow has a uh, links to everything I've talked about here. And of course, my information is at the end, so you can ask me if you want to learn more or you know, keep pointing to more data. And I'm going to make a, a quick plug for the PENREC, the Pacific Northwest Regional Economics Conference which is a, a good event for us um, sorts of economists, especially if you're working on a paper, want to get it reviewed by others. Um, this event has been important before this year in South Victoria, BC, which is pretty cool, but their website's www.penrex.org. Uh, so I invite you to check it out if you're looking for some, uh, an important economics conference that's always local. I don't think it's true. <coughs> and open to students. Yes. Open to student papers. Yeah. I still try to put something in there because um, you get people from all the universities in the Northwest. Or, you know,